Hi everyone, I am Rebecca from Come Knits and welcome to night four of the 2020 Summer Mini Skein Mini Series or the Summer Swatching Mini Series. Tonight is going to be another video in a similar vein, but we're going to bring some color mixing into our exploration of another line of food coloring. And what line of food coloring are we going to look at today? My favorite, <laughs> Wilton's Colorite Food Coloring System. This is a pigmented liquid food coloring line that comes with eight colors and they really do emphasize mixing as part of the whole kit. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. If you want to dye any type of yarn with food coloring, well, you can't dye any type of yarn. You need a wool based yarn or other protein fibers like alpaca and silk, mohair, angora, animal fibers like that will work. But you unfortunately can't dye yarn that's based on cotton or acrylic with food coloring. You can dye blends. Uh, I started my journey dyeing 20% wool, 80% acrylic yarn with food coloring. So that can work. But for the best, most pigmented results, uh, you want to make sure you're dealing with natural uh, animal protein based fibers. In addition to the food coloring and the yarn, uh, you will need heat and acid. Um, and we will be using vinegar as our acid source for this video. But if you take those, I guess, four main things, combine them in different ways, you can create so many different types of colorways, even with food coloring. The yarn we will be dyeing today is 75% Superwash Merino, 25% Nylon, and we are going to create as many combinations as we can from this eight color set. So let's go get started. The Colorite Performance Food Coloring System has eight colors in it. There is a yellow, orange, blue, pink, crimson, red, brown, and black. Uh, this is a system that is designed around accurately mixing colors and They've worked hard to make pigmented colors that work well, that won't affect the flavor of icing and things like that. And they can provide these recipes in here uh, for color mixing and recommendations for different hues, which is a really helpful starting point uh, when it comes to yarn. So for sure, this was not developed with yarn in mind, but I still refer to these recipes a lot when I am using the system to dye yarn. One of the things that's the most helpful is for dealing with the proportions. For example, this spring green that it has over here, it recommends 15 drops of yellow to three drops of blue. And so that's a handy starting point knowing, okay, we need a five to one ratio uh, for this to work well. And so that relative intensity information is helpful when it comes to mixing these colors. And like this um, more yellow green has 30 drops of yellow and two drops of blue. So that, that information is there and so you don't need to figure it out with trial and error. Of the eight colors in this system, five of the colors contain only one food coloring molecule. So the base blue is just blue number one. The base pink is just red number three. Base crimson is just red 40. Base orange is just ye yellow number six. And base yellow is just yellow number five, which from a color breaking perspective is awesome because it helps with mixing custom combinations and then we can know how things might break. I want to start off by exploring the five colors that only have one food coloring molecule in them. So I set up a little grid, a little triangle of 15 cups, and the plan is to add two drops of food coloring to each one um, in a way to make all the possible combinations of these five colors. This will help us see the relative intensity between the reds versus the yellow and the blue and yeah, we'll see how balanced of a rainbow this could give us. Now, certainly this is a red weighted rainbow because we have crimson, pink, and orange, but uh, I'm curious if the yellow is pigmented enough with just a one-to-one -one ratio, if that'll mix in some oranges with the reds. And so this will be fun to see. 
In each of the cups, I added half a cup of plain tap water. And then, uh, according to our rows, which for you are at a diagonal, um, I added one drop of each of the colors and then shifted and went the other direction. So again, each cup has a total of two drops of food coloring. Here are the 15 colors. And at first glance, we definitely have at least two greens in here. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Guess what, this is crimson and blue, so maybe, I don't know if this, my thought is that this one might end up looking a little bit like grape Kool-Aid, and this looks purplish, but it also just might be a deeper blue. It's possible that we need more red in there to make it feel more purple, but soon we will add the yarn and then we'll see. But I, I'm really excited. It's worth noting that a lot of pinks I've seen when I've mixed before we add the yarn do seem fairly orange, but this we know is just red number three and it is a vibrant pink. <laughs> so for reference, we've got crimson, which is red 40, orange, which is yellow number six, yellow, which is yellow number five, blue, blue number one, and then pink, which is red number three. And then going the other way, we have the crimson, orange, yellow, blue, and pink. While I was setting all this up, I pre-soaked 15 mini skeins of Wool to Die For's Platinum DK yarn. This yarn is 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. And I went and gently squeezed out the rest of the liquid, of the pre-soaked liquid, so that way I could start adding it to these containers. Now, I did pre-soak one extra mini skein in some water with some vinegar, and I've been using that as a little mop <laughs> as I mix up all the containers with my spoon uh, and as I use a spoon to sort of dip the yarn into the dye. This will create just a fun bonus variegated rainbow-esque mini skein. I need to add wa more water to all these containers. They still don't have any acid in them. Uh, we'll add the acid in a little bit, but uh, the most notable things I think come from our blue family. Uh, the blue that we got from mixing the orange and blue, so that's that yellow number six, is beautiful. I actually like to mix one drop of orange with one drop of blue and then dilute it a lot to get a lovely mint color. Uh, the yellow stood up here more. This is a little bit on a blue-green side versus like a true grass green, but the balance is pretty good. Uh, here, this is not quite a good purple. I think that we would need to pump up that pink volume uh, in this case where we had the red three and the blue one, but correspondingly where we had the red 40 and the blue one, we need to pump up the blue here. This is very much like grape Kool-Aid. The balance is heavier um, on, on the, the red, which is making it more of a gray purple. And so I think some of my favorite purples that I mix involve uh, the red three and then a lot more blue. But I guess if there's too much blue, then um, you get something that is, I guess, a little more on the blue side. But there's no question that we've got breaking going on in here. I saw some pinks already start to strike. That red three is the one that even with no acid might start striking. So things over in this family. There are multiple intensities of our orange. So this is just that yellow number six. And you know, it is a little more yellow if we add that yellow, but these, I guess six, I guess these are different, but these two are very, very similar, mixing the pink with either yellow or orange. And then I guess mixing, uh, yeah, the yellow and the orange. The orange seems to, I don't know. I guess concentrated yellow does look orange anyway, but those are the most like similar of everything. But just the yellow on its own and the orange on its own, so just yellow six or just yellow five, makes a huge difference. But when you're mixing with them, those differences are very subtle when it comes to reds, but I guess when it comes to the green, it made more of a difference. I am gonna go ahead off camera and add another half cup of water to each of these containers. 
but I guess this is the first look at the range you can create by mixing these primaries on a one-to-one -one ratio. And it is really nice to have concentrated versions of these single food coloring molecules so that way it does give you that range to start with mixing. But I hope that this will give will be helpful for when you start mixing to think about how you might want to shift your proportions and recipes. I still plan to look at all five of these colors mixed in with the three, I guess, pre-mixed offerings from this kit, the black, the brown, and the red. Uh, so, I mean, I think that that'll be fun to see as well, but I figured that potentially a lot of variety, especially in <laughs> the green and purple, would come here. It's hard. I wish that there were more blue offerings. Now I am going to add a teaspoon of white vinegar to each of the containers and we'll close the, stir them up, close the containers and let it sit for a couple of days. This is sort of a cool vat technique, uh, which is handy when you have a lot of samples, um, when otherwise heating this many might be somewhat cumbersome. Um, and I've done this a few times now and it works great. Uh, this kind of cool vat system is something that I'd love to set up more with full skeins outside using various containers. So this has been a mini trial run for me, if you will. But I have been really enjoying uh, playing with swatching all of these colors in this way. I think that it is super educational. Uh, and I have been learning just so much about all of these different brands. Now, in general, I call the, this Wilton Colorite food coloring system to be my favorite food coloring. And it's so pigmented and so easy to mix. Uh, if you go back and watch the AmeriColor video, uh, I found it a lot harder to use the droppers and to mix the colors in the end. So, but I know that there's a lot of personal preference and some people might prefer to have pre-mixed colors, but I like I guess I like the, the, the open-endedness of this kit and how um, it really focuses on mixing and yeah, I mean if you want to learn more about the kit I do have an affiliate link to Amazon in the video description. Uh, but in general, if you have a 40% off coupon at Michael's and Joann's or something, you can usually buy it at a discount. And I typically will go for buying another full kit at a discount, which I think the, the full kit starts at about $20, maybe $24. Uh, I usually do that versus buying them individually, but yeah, so that's my recommendation for getting this mix kit. Now, if you wanted to mix these colors to break the colors, which means that you would see it split. I sort of mentioned it over here with this purpley color, how the pinks are striking first and then the blues. So we'll probably see a combination of purple, pink, and blue in this one. But if you wanna see colors break, which ones might break? Definitely these two, which have our red and blue, because blues strike the slowest. Um, in general, first are red number three, the pink, um, strikes the fastest, then the crimson, the red 40. The two yellows, I don't really have a difference between them because if, once you get yellow super concentrated, it looks orange anyway. But yeah, between the two, they are somewhat in the middle. And then blue is the slowest, it needs the most time and acid. So yeah, I mean, I think that, do oranges break? They could, if you have a lot of, if you have a lot more yellow than the red number three, then you might really see that breaking. But again, since really concentrated yellow can look orange, that can be a little harder to say for sure. But I do think we might see some multiple hues and some more pink and less pink areas in this particular orange. I think most of the informative nature of this I guess sort of swatching series almost, is when they're wet and laid out and organized. I'm not hanging on to these as perfect swatches for the, the color combination. So I think that, you know, this wet tableau is a really good representation of what you can get. 
Now, obviously, the intensity can vary if you have more or less of the colors, but as a starting point of where to go when you want to mix the colors, this is really helpful. And I have found that between 10 and 20 drops gives a beautiful intensity of color um, on using this food coloring system. But I'm not even sure. Uh, I hope things don't get too mixed up just because the other videos I've done thus far have been more of like a full on grid. And so, yeah, I guess maybe I'll try to, I'm going to try to keep them in order as best I can. Maybe like this. Hopefully uh, that'll work. But anyway, we'll come back in a couple days and get ready to microwave these to do a final set of the color. I probably could just microwave things in the plastic containers. In fact, towards the end of some of the other videos, I've done that for a few of the samples. But it takes longer to get things to heat up and it's a lot easier to just be able to put everything in a bowl together and steam set it. And with the exception of the Easter egg dye tablet ones, I haven't seen a lot of color transfer at that stage. And so that's worked really well as a really like fast way to process the yarn towards the end versus then having a lot of like hot containers that you're waiting to clear, like sitting around the house. Uh, so while uh, my filming time is more limited, it, this like wait a few days and then heat set technique has been working really nicely for me. You know, it, it's funny, this is not originally what I had envisioned at all for the 2020 Summer Mini Skein mini series. I thought that I wanted to create a bunch of fade sets versus having a sampler from each night. So that was part of my vision. But yeah, it's just once I decided to swatch those Easter egg dye tablets, I was like, oh, I want to swatch this one and I want to swatch this one. And so it sort of shifted and evolved, which is a really fun way to go about dyeing as it is. When you start playing with adding color to yarn, uh, sometimes it's worth having a vision and going for it. And that can be a lot of fun and I enjoy that. But it can also be fun seeing where the colors take you and seeing what the process itself inspires. And I'm really excited to see this yarn dry and see how it turns out. Why are the three premixed colors red, brown, and black? Well, I think because those are probably the most difficult ones to mix on your own. Now, the black won't really give black on yarn, but for icing color, it could. And so, and again, with icing color, reds are hard. Straight reds are one of the harder colors to do because each of them might be a little too orange or a little too pink versus getting that balance correctly. Yeah, in addition to the red three, the red 40, the base red color also has yellow five and yellow six in it. So it's clearly a formula that takes more wiggling and you can't otherwise have a simple, you know, three drops of that and eight drops of this kind of recipe. But I refer to this little recipe guide that they include with the set of all eight colors a lot when it comes to mixing colors and especially for some pastels and various hues. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I think, really, really helpful. It's now a few days later and we can start opening up these containers. I chose to go with the blue first. Uh -huh, the water is clear. Since blues tend to take the most heat, acid, and time, I wanted to open that one first just to check. And I think, yep, this is looking great. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the rest and we'll just take another peek. Along the bottom, these are the five samples that have just two drops of one of the colors that is just one food coloring molecule. So we've got a base crimson, which is just red 40, base orange, which is just yellow number six, base yellow, which is just yellow number five, base blue, which is only blue number one, and base pink, which is just red number three. And here you can clearly see the difference between these shades. The difference between yellow and orange is significant, 
and the difference between our red 40 and our red number three is significant as well. And I think that this can show why most drink mixes that have red 40, the purples tend to be deeper, a little bit more gray almost, just because that red doesn't have the same brightness and it's harder to make a brighter purple with food coloring. And here in this purple, we do have some subtle, but we do have some breaking. You can see more blue and more pink and more purple patches in here. Uh, from mixing just one drop of pink with one drop of blue, we also have a significant amount of breaking. Wow, this is actually gorgeous. Um, there's more purple in here than I thought initially, but we also still see pink and blue because of the way those color molecules separate. Now, I don't expect, uh, I mean, maybe we have a hint of breaking, some breaking here. Uh, creamy Peach from Wilton's Icing Colors Breaks, you can see a tiny bit of pink and orange in here, and so that is technically breaking. I'm realizing I can't see. Yeah, so there's like a tiny bit of pink. Um, it's very subtle, but I think that with the right conditions, you could exaggerate that more. Um, the pink and orange is gonna be more subtle with the, the yellow number six, just because it is orange to begin with. I mean, in some of these, like for example, when we're looking at the single red, here, there is gonna to be tonal variation in this skein. You can see light patches and darker patches from where the color absorbed. But this is not breaking because it's all shades of the same hue. When we're talking about breaking, and again, bringing up our most extreme example, you see multiple different colors, even though we had one color that we mixed originally. Now I need to go finish setting all of these colors. So I'm gonna take the yarn, and gently squeeze out this liquid and I'm placing it in a microwave safe bowl. Now the one downside at this stage is that uh, I am no longer ha gonna have like a clear uh, grid of where the colors are because some of them are so similar that it would be a little hard to place back in the exact right order. But by mixing, you can create these subtle differences, even though there were only five colors to start with. Um, we're gonna look at the pre-mixed colors and these single colors in combination with that in a moment. But what I'm gonna do now is take this bowl, cover it with a silicone microwave safe cover, and then I'm gonna microwave it on high for two to four minutes total using two minute increments on high so we can make sure these colors are well set. And I'm gonna do that with the rest of these colors as well. I set up more cups to get ready for our next round. This time we are adding the three premixed colors to the mix. We've got base brown, which has red 40, yellow five, and blue one in it. We have base black, which has blue one, red 40, yellow six, red three, and yellow five. So all of the colors. And then finally there's base red, which is red three, red 40, yellow six, and yellow five. I wanted to look at these three colors on their own with each other, but then also with the five single colors that we had looked at last time, just to compare color intensity at that one-to-one -one ratio. So once again, I filled all the cups with half a cup of water, added a total of two drops of color, um, depending on the various mix, and then stirred them up. I think of all of the color right colors, the base red is the one that I use the least. This color is very pigmented. It's also thicker and a little more globby. So I think in general, it's a little harder to drop um, one drop into the mix. Um, but, you know, I just, I generally prefer to stick with crimson and pink, but I do use it on occasion. I think my last mixing time lapse was cut a little short, but as I was mixing, I did wipe my spoon on a yarn mop of yarn soaked in vinegar. And right away, you can see from our brown, black, and red combinations that, well, I think that the, those three colors are gonna dominate based on the intensity of the color, um, the amount of food coloring that is in each of them. 
the and I don't know if you noticed but the blacks probably aren't gonna look very black but now I'm gonna take the pre-soaked yarn and we're gonna add it to all of the containers and tap it down um, I removed a little more of the water from the pre-soak with my spin dryer and then started adding the yarn to the containers. But as I was doing this, I realized the volume was really low and I think I added the extra water after the yarn the first time, but now I don't remember. I probably should have added that excess water before adding the yarn, that would have been easier. And I really discovered this as I tried to start mixing. <laughs> So then I went and grabbed a half cup of more tap water to bring the total volume up to one cup of water and started using a spoon that I wiped on the yarn mop in between to tap down the yarn. And the colors looked less pigmented than what I expected. So I did more mixing and flipping the yarn over. And in this process, you could already see some colors breaking. Red threes that base pink will start to strike really, really quickly. And even with not very much acid present at all. And my tap water does run slightly acidic. So yeah, I think that this mix is gonna have lots of broken colors, lots of modeling, and the variety of these muted hues we got is fantastic. I still am gonna need to add acid to all of these, but I'm really excited with these hues, especially these mixtures with the black and brown. There are a lot of hues in here. I think, especially from our black mixture, we've got like a burgundy, we've got some greens, we've got blues and purples. Um, that gives us a really nice range. And with mixing with the brown, we do have this beautiful spruce green almost from mixing it with blue. That's really pretty. But we also have more yellow browns, more red browns, Lots of beautiful muted hues. The red, <laughs> I would say with the exception of the blue, um, yes, adding the orange or yellow makes it more orange, but otherwise, these three are really, really similar. But, I mean, that makes sense. If you add crimson or pink to red, it's going to be very similar. But overall, there's a lot more variety here than I think I anticipated. I thought some of the results would be more subtle and that maybe we would need a two, for example, like a two yellow to one brown to make more of a difference. And sure, these are subtle, but they're still different from what we see right here. Can browns and greens break? Yes. Basically any mixture that has both red number three and a bunch of other colors in it will likely break. And if we were to look at these with some dip dyeing, we would definitely see that. But Besides purple, black food coloring is probably the most notorious of a color breaker. And this row is where we see the most modeling, especially like even in our greens. And that's just because of all the vast number of colors that are in there. And especially when some of those reds are present at low amounts, you're more likely to see a difference as they separate and give us these hues, which will result in gorgeous, gorgeous yarn. I mean, the, the results make, or these preliminary results, I suppose, they make sense. This is a kit that was designed with color mixing in mind. And a lot of liquid food colorings are designed for color mixing. But compared to Wilton's pre-mixed icing colors, uh, this, I think, system was probably developed because with the icing colors, it's harder to mix when you're having to measure it in a measuring spoon. There can be some inconsistency. And so with these droppers, it's a bit easier to be consistent. Um, I'm not trying to oversell you on it or anything, but it is, I don't know, it's just, I think, one of the easiest liquid food coloring drops to work with. So I just added one teaspoon of white vinegar to each of these containers. And then off camera, I am going to quickly go ahead and mix these up um, just so that way that vinegar can move around. And then we will place the covers on. I know that it's a bit of a shame to have the most squatch that things in order at you know, this stage when it's wet versus when it's dry. And maybe someday I would go through and make swatches to make actual color cards or something. But ultimately, I think that the goal of this 
mini series and doing all these swatches is to demonstrate the range of colors that you can create and that within one line or one kit we can create things that are similar um, and to give a quick I guess overview so that way you can decide for yourself what kind of food coloring you might like to play with the most. Now this is something in theory I could also do with acid dyes someday. Uh, it might be, I mean a lot of people have done it. Um, I highly recommend you go and check out Nicole Frost. She has extensive color card information and has played with I think almost every brand of acid dye out there. Uh, and so I recommend that you go check out uh, her Instagram for more information. All right, I'm gonna go set these aside out of the way, far away from where my children can disturb them for a couple of days to let the color absorb into the yarn slowly. Okay, here are the finished colors. And there are a few mini conclusions that I would wanna give while we still have things in order. So this is our brown row, black, red, and then we mix them with pink, blue, uh, yellow, orange, crimson, and then red, black, brown. I had to think about that because the rainbow is going in the opposite order. So my favorite of these was the mixtures with black. We got, especially this green is really nice, but you can see for sure that we have some breaking in here. There are some reddish patches in with this green, which is really lovely, but that's because of all the things that are present in the black. Even with this deeper blue, um, you can see that we've got some purple in there and there is also some breaking. And then of course, if you're gonna add red number three to anything, you will probably see some breaking, which we do here. Now, mixing the red mixture, ah, we've got, it doesn't look like there's anything that wasn't dissolved, uh, but do we see breaking in here? It's hard to tell because since everything is red and pink, it could be a saturation difference. So that, when you're dealing with mixtures of reds, that's where it's a lot harder to make definitive answers. But this is the one that I think will be most interesting to people that don't dye a lot of food coloring. This is black. This was two drops of black. It is not the most pigmented. Um, it's actually less pigmented than I expected. And it's definitely not black. It is blue and purple. <laughs> so if you want more black, use more drops and it'll get more pigmented. But black is really hard to achieve and grays are hard to achieve with food coloring just because the, the colors that exist are so bright you need a mixture. The mixture of the brown and the blue, eh, it's definitely broken as well, but uh, it feels a little more black than the two drops of black over there. Uh, the red mixtures all look really, really similar. So adding a little bit of crimson to red is, you know, I would say that maybe there's a bit more pigment in this one. I think that the colors might be blown out on camera. It'll be a little easier when they're dry, but the difference is it's, it's going to be hard to tell the difference between some of those later on. What we can definitively see here is that the colors have absorbed and I'm going to go ahead and set these in the microwave just like we did last time. However, as we're getting ready to do this, let's take a closer look. Okay, this is our black with the base pink. This is our black with the base crimson. And then here is our black with the base red. And all three of these are different. So this was the pink, crimson, and red. And they are distinct. And so this I think illustrates really nicely why we have three different reds in this mix. Um, not just because of the difficulty to achieve different types of pink and red in icing color, but also when it comes to mixing, you get significantly different types of hues depending on which one you use. And this can be amplified more when you're doing something that isn't 
the one-to-one -one ratios that we were looking at in this video. But anyway, I just wanted to highlight this little comparison here. Even the brown mixtures, we have six, I would say six different hues here. Uh, the brown colors that we got from the blue and from the black are more distinct um, because those are both more cool toned colors. But these all together are absolutely gorgeous and subtle. And so I think that this particular mix that I'm showing right here shows how you can really achieve some beautiful subtle differences and nice muted tones even with food coloring. Commercial dyes uh, don't come in liquid form so it's not as easy to do a drop by drop comparison but you can mix uh, dye stocks of your primary colors and then create a triangle grid and explore different proportions to get a sense of how you want to mix these colors together and that can be a really really useful exercise to play with. I think of all the colors the base red color is probably the most saturated and the difference between these like warmer tone colors mixed with the base red are very, very subtle. Uh, so, that, so that is worth also keeping in mind when you are planning your mixing. We have some staining in some of these containers from our base red, but yeah, it's not really the liquid, it's more of just some staining on the bottle or in the container itself. And so that is something that I will be able to go and rinse out. When I go and wash this yarn, I'm going to go ahead and do it off camera. I'm not anticipating seeing any bleeding from here because all of the color really did absorb to our yarn, but uh, I will come back in and show you if anything um, changes. But each uh, plate that I'm putting in the microwave, I'm microwaving on high for two minutes. Maybe some might need an additional minute to get hot enough and then letting them cool completely before I wash them. Here are all of the colors we created with the Wilton Colorite food coloring system using only two drops at a time. So this meant that our color combinations were limited to either two drops of one of the colors or one drop of one and one drop of the other. And well, <laughs> first thing you'll notice is that this skews red and pink. But this isn't surprising because of the eight colors present in this kit, there are three red and pinks in there. So with only one blue, and I guess black is fairly cool toned as well, but with only one blue, there is a limit <laughs> of how many cool tones you can create when you're only dealing with two drops. If you're gonna do more than two drops, then you can create a much wider range of blues and greens with this as well. Uh, so that's just worth keeping in mind. This top row, is looking at all of the non-mixture colors. So we looked at the colors that were just made out of red 3, red 40, yellow 5, yellow 6, and blue 1. And again, this skews very heavily on this red and orange uh, because you have a pink, a red, and an orange. And so that gives you more of those color combinations. But it's bright and it's fun and it's beautiful. With the addition of the brown, the black, and the base red, we got more, a bigger range of muted colors. I think a lot of the hues that we created with the red are very, very similar. Uh, but once you, if you mix it with the black or with the blue, then we got more purples and other tones. Um, but this is fairly consistent with the huge range of red and orange that we saw from just using uh, those more primary colors of base crimson, base pink, base orange, base yellow, and base blue. I mentioned this near the beginning, but my favorite thing with the Wilton Colorite food coloring system is that in addition to having some colors that are really only one food coloring molecule, because with my color breaking experiments, it's just fun to play with that. But I like that they contain mixing recipes in with the kit. And so that's really helpful when it comes to the proportions and knowing how much you want to mix to get the color that you want. You know, like for example, this green was one to one, yellow and blue, but if we wanted something more teal, 
then we'd need more blue. If we wanted something more lime, you need more yellow. But you don't always necessarily know where that balance is starting with one to one. So seeing the ratios that they recommend of sometimes even five to one can just be really, really helpful. Especially if, if you wanted to plan a fade set, for example, going from yellow to blue with intermediate colors in between, that intermediate middle color might not be the one to one ratio. It could be, but it might not be. So you might need to play around with things more. We used two drops of food coloring on 20 grams of yarn. So to achieve any of these colors on 100 grams of yarn, you would use a total of 10 drops of food coloring, which isn't a lot. <laughs> a lot of times I would say with this brand, I would use between 10 and 30 drops of color, uh, but you can see we got really good medium saturation levels here. I'll admit that I don't consider color mixing a strength of mine but it is something that it's easier to get better and better at the more you play with it and the more you play with a dye type whether it's food coloring or acid dyes or fiber reactive dyes you learn more about the relative intensity of colors and so if there's something you want to mix you start to get a innate instinct as to how much of each of the colors you want to use and so that's just worth keeping in mind. The two yarn mops that we created are both really, really cute. And I'm not sure what I'm going to be using them for, but I will probably be holding on to them for some kind of future project. All right, outside of those yarn mops, we have 36 skeins here. I'm now going to go and try to divide these into some fun fade sets. So wish me luck. It is easier to create a fade set thinking about the colors than to dye a bunch of colors and try to arrange them into sets. And we've got a bit of a range here. There are a lot that are fairly subtle, with the exception of our brighter rainbow here. But yeah, it was a little hard to think about how to put some of this together. I mean, I suppose that the yellow could be replaced with like an orange and the yellow could have gone over there to one of them, but it just stands out more than some of those subtle orange transitions. And so I guess that's why I arranged them this way. I was going through and trying to see if there was some way that I could shift things around to make one more set. But I think that the issue is that the colors that feel more muted are really distinct from the ones that feel more bright. And without some more intermediate muted tones, it's really hard to combine our muted colors with the brighter colors, if that makes sense. I'm not saying it's impossible. So if there's a way that you would arrange this to be able to create a fifth set that felt cohesive, please let me know down in the comments uh, what you would swap around. One other thing is I think that if I were to take these two sets and put them together, ooh, that's so beautiful. Or even combine it with this one too. Oh, oh, I love it. Like all three of those go so, so well together. Oh man. Ooh, no, I'm thinking. Uh, I wonder if that's just all of the, I guess I don't know for sure, but most of the brown and most of the black combinations that we had. This almost works and could be beautiful depending on how um, it was knit or crocheted up, but it still feels like something is missing um, versus feeling really cohesive. What did you think? The colors we got today are beautiful. There's less of a range of what we got last night with Americolor, but we had 50 colors there that were pre-mixed and we were dealing today with combinations of eight colors when we were using about a 50-50 mix of each one. You could create a wider range of colors if you bring things up to more than just two drops. I would also say that it does look like two drops of Colorite is less pigmented than five drops of Americolor. So I'm not sure what the correct ratio is there, but I do want to acknowledge that. The colors we created tonight were less pigmented than last night, but we also had no bleeding at all, no color bleeding. And the colors were easier to dissolve in 
uh, the water, even though I may have started with more warm water, from some other experience playing with replicating the techniques specifically from nights three and four, uh, the Colorite is so much easier to work with. So, so much easier to work with. Uh, but I still love some of those Americolor colors. So, you know, take, take these recommendations for uh, what you will. It's funny that Colorite is my favorite system when I'm not usually the biggest fan of color mixing, but I think that given that they designed this for you to mix, that makes it a lot easier. And it really is my favorite food coloring. If I can choose any one that I want to use, that's the one that I will most often pick. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I really hope you've enjoyed these videos where we look at the range of colors from a few different food coloring sources. Please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel so you never miss a new video. I release at least two new yarn dyeing videos every week, and with your notifications on, you won't miss special series. And it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun here. If you're already a huge fan of Chemnitz and want to support us on another level, I do have a Patreon. You can find a link down in the video description. I also have an Etsy shop and some limited merch on Zazzle and links for everything will be in the video description. Thank you so much for watching everyone. I really hope that you are enjoying this summer mini skein mini series or summer mini swatching mini series, whatever we want to call it this year. Uh, but it's not over. Uh, tomorrow night there is going to be one more video, a vlog of me putting together the summer sets and some of my thoughts and process along the way. I don't often film vlogs, but it was really fun to share some things that I was thinking when I couldn't share spoilers and I really wanted to share spoilers. So I hope that I can see you tomorrow night as we watch that video at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much for watching.